go for it! Hey everybody, it's me, your buddy Dave, the host here at The Dark Stuff on YouTube. Thanks a lot for checking out my newest video. Uh, the response to my last uh, catalog ranking, which was for Husker Du, was incredibly good. Uh, and not a single negative comment or thumbs down, which now just invites people to go and give it a thumbs down. But whatever, fuck you if you do something like that. So I, I told you I was going to do other bands, and uh, this, this time uh, we're going to do Super Chunk. Super Chunk is one of my all-time favorite bands. I've been a fan of theirs 30 plus years at this point. They went 30, 30 plus, whatever, right around that time. They are absolutely one of the most consistently great bands uh, of any era, the 90s especially. And uh, I've said this in many uh, music discussions, debates, whatever, online, in person, that I think Super Chunk is the best singles band of the 90s. I mean, hands down, nobody had better singles than Super Chunk. It was just fucking hit after hit after hit after hit. Um, I first got into Super Chunk, who, by the way, began in uh, North Carolina in 1989. I probably got into them sometime in 90 or 91. Um, because I was, uh, I'm, I was and still am a big fan of the band Firehose. And Firehose, at that time, in the early 90s, was playing... Super Chunk song Slack Motherfucker in their live set. And that was the first time I'd ever heard of Super Chunk because Mike Watt gets on the mic and he's like, um, this is a song by a band called Super Chunk. It's about working for an asshole. And then they play the song. And I used to have a ton of live tapes of, of uh, Firehose because I used to you know, trade tapes back in the day. And uh, so I heard it over and over. It made me go get the single and then that was this. Okay, this is the Slack Motherfucker single. One of the greatest uh punk rock indie rock anthems of all time so after i started getting into super chunk i went and got their debut album the self-titled one and i saw them somewhere around this time i don't know if if the second album had come out yet if no pocket for kitty had come out yet all i remember of the show was it was not very well attended there was maybe a dozen people there or so uh, but super chunk played like they were playing at the fucking garden or whatever um, Mac had like long hair and which is unusual because you haven't seen him like that in a long time Laura had these like Crazy ass dreads or whatever and she was just thrashing around the whole time And I don't think you, could, you ever even saw her face the entire uh, show <laughs> You know because she was just so busy rocking out um, I know that Jim was there at the time, but I don't know who was on oh, No, let me put that again. Okay. I know that Jim was there I know that it wasn't John Worcester on drums that first time. I remember that because the next time I saw Super Chunk, I met John a little bit after the show. We spoke for like two minutes, and he had said this was the first time he had played in Madison with Super Chunk. So obviously it was the um, uh, original drummer on that one. So that original lineup was Mac McCann, guitar, vocals, was Laura Balance, bass. It was Jack McCook on guitar and Chuck Garrison, sometimes known as Chunk, <laughs> uh, on drums. And uh, that, was, that was the band that did the first album, but the band has basically had the same lineup, which would be Jim Wilbert on guitar and uh, John Worcester on drums, since 1992, so almost 30 years with the same exact lineup. Okay, as we begin the rankings, we're gonna you know, clarify what does count, what doesn't count. So it, this is just a straight up studio albums in their catalog, that's 11 albums. I'm not including 
um, any of those like Clam Bake live records or any of their various singles comps because if I did it would be spoiler alert this would be the best album in Super Chunk's catalog okay this incidental music 91 to 95 uh, hands down my favorite Super Chunk record but in this instance it doesn't count so unfortunately uh, that was it's not part of the rankings So coming in at number 11 of the 11 albums in Super Chunk's catalog is their eighth album, Here's to Shutting Up. This album was released in 2001. It was actually released one week after uh, 9-11. So obviously the world was like preoccupied at that point. So, you know, the album kind of got overlooked initially by me anyways, because I know I didn't pick it up until 2002 or so, even like months later. Um, I just, you know, everyone is in that weird headspace post 9-11. Um, but the album came out, it was produced by Brian Paulson, who they'd worked with previously on Foolish, which is considered by many to be, you know, if not their best, among their best. We'll see where it ranks in, in my list. It's a pretty mellow album in general, and it kind of follows in a line of records that the band started doing in about 1997 with the album Indoor Living. You know, in addition to kind of a quieter material, they were also experimenting a bit with the production by putting in, you know, horns or strings or keyboards and just different ways of presenting the songs. In some ways, a little more similar to Portostatic, um, but there was still enough of a distinction between the two. There were still some good ele- you know, elements that, that kept it sounding like Super Chunk. Um, there were a lot of acoustic guitars, kind of whispered vocals from, uh, from Mac, you know, even like the, the rockers, like Rainy Streets or something are, are still kind of mellower, you know, they, they, uh, experiment with a country sort of twang on phone sex. You know, Mac's singing is, is different on this album than in the early days, and he even does some falsetto on the song Art Class. In general, this is not a Super Chunk album I pull out when I feel like listening to Super Chunk. This is one that maybe will pop up on Shuffle and then I'll be like, oh, okay, I remember this, I like this. So I'd say my favorite songs on the record are Rainy Streets, um, Act Surprised, Out on the Wing. But in general, the reason why this is number 11 is it just it's not as memorable to me. And uh, I, they, don't, they don't rev it up enough, you know? And I just, I know they're... Bands don't want to do the same thing over and over, and I totally respect that. Um, but when you do something new, you know, I, I want to like that too. I mean, I'm trying, but here's to shutting up is is not, not the one that does it for me. Okay, coming in at number 10 is the 1997 album Indoor Living, just referenced in my previous one. It's the band's sixth album, produced by a guy named John Plymail. And uh, I don't really know his resume, but I know he's in the North Carolina area, worked with a lot of a lot of good bands. This was the beginning of the transition into this sort of new super chunk sound that I mentioned while talking about, uh, you know, in the previous album. It's transitioning into a little bit, again, experimental with the with the production, different instrumentation. You got the keyboards, you got that sort of stuff. You basically have a more subdued, quieter sound in general. There are some rockers on there, no question, but coming off, here's where the strings come in, which was their 1995 album, their fifth album, and an extremely successful record. They definitely were trying to make a point, at least Mac was, in terms of what he wanted to do for the future. It was no more, you know, two minute, two and a half minute, you know, ragers and and that kind of thing, just, you know, with a really high pitched voice and, you know, just rocking out. You can't do that forever. And I get it, you get older, you just don't, you want to go into different areas. Um, And, you know, it's hard as a long, as as a long time fan of the band, as they're changing into this new sound, to say like, you know, it's just not as good as the old stuff or, you know, I don't like this new stuff, you know. Because the band, if they did the same thing over and over, then you'd be bitching about, why do they always sound the same on every album, you know? You can't win to a certain extent. So, I respect Super Chunk, again, for trying, for doing something different. This just is the beginning of the period where I start kind of losing a little bit of interest in Super Chunk, because by the late 90s, um, you know, when they had a new album out, I would always go get it, but they certainly weren't, I wasn't as excited about the, the stuff 
as I was, you know, seven, eight years earlier when I first got into them and it was just every single single was so exciting and, and whatever. So the best songs on Indoor Living are probably um, the popular music, which I think is most like the sort of classic, classic sound. Um, New Bruises, Born Last Sunday. Watery Hands was the first single. That's a good song. European Medicine is also a really good track. So those are my favorites on that one. But Indoor Living is uh, comes in at number 10. Okay, coming in at number 9 is the band's seventh album, Come Pick Me Up, which came out in 1999. It follows Indoor Living. It's produced by Jim O'Rourke, who's mostly known for kind of a more experimental and, uh, you know, kind of avant-garde stuff. And apparently the band chose him particularly because he did different kinds of music than the producers that he'd been working with. Jim O'Rourke, of course, later on became a member of Sonic Youth for a couple years. He might have been at this point. I really, I don't know when his uh, tenure in Sonic Youth actually uh, began and ended. So O'Rourke, um, as producer, added a lot of stuff like strings and keyboards and horns, probably most notably on the song Pink Clouds, or at least that's where I feel like it's the most effective. It does provide kind of a stark difference to their normal guitar sound when you listen to it. Now, um, it's not on every track, you know, it's not like it's, you're hearing this big uh, symphonic production or, or whatever, but um, you do hear it on certain tracks, and when you do, it's sort of stark different the first time you hear it. It has a looser feel than the last album, Indoor Living. And I think because the material is kind of similar, I like this looser feel better, and hence it's ranked higher, you know? I think the album has a better dynamic to it. It has a better balance and tempo. I think it sounds a little bit better. So in general, you know, I think Come Pick Me Up is an improvement off Indoor Living. And, it, you know, at the time, Again, you know, it was in that period where I just wasn't as focused on Super Chunk. So a lot of this is going back and re-listening to the stuff because I really didn't give it as much of a, a chance at the time, you know. Now looking back, <clears throat> you know, I find a lot of other stuff about it that I do like. As far as my favorite songs on the album, I would say Hello Hawk, which is a single. Uh, Good Dreams, Cursed Mirror. Um, and I really like the guitar solo in uh, Tiny Bombs. And I've always been unclear as to who's doing what in Super Chunk as far as the guitars go. Because, you know, it, it, Jim is just a guitar player. Mac plays guitar and sings. But I'm not sure who's always doing lead and whatever. But whoever does the solo on Tiny Bombs, that's really fucking good. My number eight album is the uh, I Hate Music album, released in 2013. It was the band's 10th album. Now, after they did the album Here's to Shutting Up in 2001, Super Chunk like, largely went kind of on hiatus. And for the next nine years, they played very sporadically. They put out a song or two here and there, like on a soundtrack or some type of compilation or something. But for the most part, they had kind of checked out. And never broke up, but just were always kind of on this this indeterminate status, you know. So they came back in 2010 with their first album in nearly a decade. And it was a triumphant return. We'll talk about it later. The next album following that was I Hate Music, which was three years after that in 2013. It was a great follow-up to that album, Majesty Shredding. It sort of continues in that direction, but I don't think it's quite as good. Um... Uh, as as Majesty Shredding. You know, there's great songs. I mean, the best songs on the album are FOH, Front of House, Low F, Your Theme. And those songs are excellent. And there's a lot of other excellent songs too. But what I was finding when I was re-listening to it was I didn't remember these songs as much as I did when I would threw on all my the other old Super Chunk records and played them again. They had a punk shredder, uh, Staying at Home, Trees of Barcelona, Out of the Sun were were very good. And you know what they reminded me of was kind of that late 90s period. But with this one, I just felt like this, I wish that maybe uh, those three albums that we talked about, you know, Indoor Living, etc., did those songs the way Trees of, of Barcelona and Out of the Sun were done. I just, it's that sort of style, but I just like it a lot better, the way it sounds, the, the feel or whatever. I don't know how to exactly articulate it, but I just feel like, uh, uh, they were done in that style, but better. So coming in at number seven is the band's debut album, self-titled K-1. 
came out in 1990, oddly uh, released on the exact same day as the last Replacements album, which is sort of strange because in my world, Super Chunk kind of became my new favorite band after the Replacements broke up. So it's, you know, serendipitous or I don't know. Am I using that word correctly? Not even sure. So this, of course, featured the original lineup, which is Mac, Laura, Jack McCook, and Chuck Garrison. So half the band is different than the band you're used to in terms of Super Chunk. Now, with with some bands, you know, their their first album is like the best they're ever gonna do. You know what I mean? Like they have been working on these songs for years and years and years, and they're finally putting it out on their first album, and it's just perfection. Every song is just like you know, cut after cut, hit after hit after hit. Um, and then other bands, you know, it takes them a while to warm up a little bit. The first album is just kind of a hint, just a little bit of a taste. In Super Chunk's case, it's the latter. Okay, so you're just getting the taste of what they would later become. Um, the album is uh, is great, of course, and I love it. Even the great, you know, grungy production, you know, which is totally perfect for that time. And although it is kind of a little bit uh, grungy, but uh, you can still hear all the all the instruments, uh, you know, clearly, and you can hear the playing. Laura is just fucking a monster on the bass on that album. She is just going to town, smashing the shit out of it, you know. Great stuff. Um... You know, it, it, the material is almost all good, but it's a band's debut album, you know. Mac has become a, an amazing songwriter over the years. This was, he was probably, I don't know, 19 or 20 or something when he did this. Um, so there's some of it a, is a little bit samey, but for the most part, um, it, this is still a stellar debut album, better than some bands ever do later on in their career. Um, favorite songs on this album are, of course, Slack Motherfucker, which was the first single. Um, sick to move, slow, binding. Um, you know, those are, those are my favorites, I guess. Looking for something just to hold on to. Coming in at number six is the band's most recent album, at least as of this recording. It's their 11th album, came out in 2018, titled What a Time to Be Alive. Produced by a guy named Bo Sorensen, who I'm sorry, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with his work. I'm sure he's done a lot of great stuff. The album is raw fast aggressive um there are some songs on this record honestly that you could would fit in on really early albums like no pocky for kitty or on the mouth they're that you know just blazing and 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 rocking or whatever um lyrically it deals a lot with the political climate in 2018 no secret what max politics are uh, he's very liberal very troubled by what had been going on in the country you know uh same as me if i'm if i'm you know full disclosure um, in fact they even in one song uh, reference uh chelsea manning and i got cut they, they mentioned her so it's probably the closest to that old sound you know since since they did the on the mouth album you know there's it's just really really solid and again, lyrical content is is fresh, it's current. Uh, the album closes with a great song called Black Thread. It's a good kind of mid-tempo song. Um, this is a really, really solid album. And again, this is nearly 30 years since the band's debut. And they're still doing this high quality music. The fact that it comes in number six um, is just a testament to just their amazing consistency. The best songs on this record are probably uh, the title cut, What a Time to Be Alive, Bad Choices, Erasure, which features Katie Crutchfield from Waxahachie on it, Lost My Brain, amazing, Reagan Youth, super great punk rock. A great album from a veteran band sounding just as fresh, fresher even, than when they started. Coming in at number five is the band's uh, 2010 album, Majesty Shredding. It was their ninth album, produced by Scott Solter. And this was the comeback album. Uh, you know, I referenced the hiatus after 2001's album, Here's to Shutting Up. They were gone for a period of time. They were back, and they made a statement with Majesty Shredding. Well, it turns out that their return from hiatus was a true return to form. I mean, it absolutely was. The album sounds great. Uh, the production is really, really nice. There are a little bit of keyboards on there, but for the most part, it's just guitar, bass, drums, and a good song, you know? And that's all you needed from Super Chunk. Um, nothing goes slower than like mid-tempo, really. And it's just, it, it was, it so reaffirmed my love of this band. I was so fucking excited when this album was good, you know? Because you, you never know. And sometimes 
uh, bands are gone for a long time, and they come back, and they're just... It's just not there. It's not as good. Uh, with Superchunk, to me, this was the best music that they had done in 15 years. So I was very, very impressed with uh, Majesty Shredding. Best songs on that record. My favorite is Crossed Wires. Um, I like Digging for Something, Fractured in Plaster, Rope Light, Learn to Surf, Everything at Once. Really, really great stuff. Not a bad track on the album at all. Uh, my number four album is Foolish from 1994. The band's fourth album produced by Brian Paulson. It has a really, really bright sound. It's excellent production, probably their best to date at that time. Um, this album is known as the sort of the drama album, okay, because it came right after um, Mac and Laura, who had been dating the entire time of the band, had broken up. Their relationship was over. Now, sometimes when that sort of thing happens in a band, the band ends, somebody leaves the band, etc. Or you're like Fleetwood Mac and you write an album like Rumors and it sells 30 million albums and everybody gets to hear the drama, you know. Uh, but unlike Fleetwood Mac, you know, Superchunk only has one writer and that's Mac and so you get the whole story just from his perspective, okay? So you don't have Laura singing a, an answer song to that, you know, the way they do on Fleetwood Mac. Um, so that's okay. I mean, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's not required, but, you know, I have read plenty of interviews with Laura where she sort of talked about that period as being very difficult uh, because, you know, you have to sit there and hear the songs which you know are about you, you know, every night and just sort of play along and, and, and pretend like it doesn't bother you. Fortunately for everyone in the music world, that didn't end Super Chunk. That didn't, end, you know, nobody left the band. They were able to soldier on and make this really, really uh, brilliant record. The album opens kind of slowly with Like a Fool. It gets into the uh, rocking again right away after that. The album it has great sequencing. It's very, very well paced. You get, um, you know, kind of a perfect balance between the, the fast rockers and the mid range stuff. And then towards the end of the album, you have this really sort of slow ending. Well, basically like the last four songs, Keeping Track, Revelations, uh, Stretched Out, In a Stage Whisper, you know, it sort of ends on a, on a slower thing, but it's, it, it works so well in that one. Okay, uh, my favorite songs on the record are definitely the first part, uh, the uh, indie rock power ballad, <laughs> Driveway to Driveway, and I don't say that in a negative or pejorative way, I really mean it, it's like I don't see that as a negative, but it is kind of the indie rock uh, uh, power ballad there Saving My Ticket Kicked In And In A Stage Whisper Is a great closer for the album And it's got great lead guitar at the end Again, I don't know who's doing it Whether it's Mac or Jim But it's, it's great again And it's a great, great, great closer To an excellent and emotionally draining album Foolish is my number four Coming in at number three is the band's fifth album, Here's Where the Strings Come In, released in 1995. Now, I think this album would perhaps be my number one if it weren't for the production. It's produced by a guy named Wally uh, Gaggle, or Gaggle, I'm not sure. And it just has a flat, dingy sound. It's got amazing material. Every song is fucking excellent, but for some reason, I just listen to it and I don't like the way the instruments sound. I don't like the guitars. I don't like the way that it sounds in the room, like the drums. I mean, all of it. And as the playing is great, it just I don't like the production on this particular record, and it it hurts it in a way, you know. Okay, the record has a kind of a world-worn feel, like the band has just been touring and playing and recording their asses off for five, six years or whatever, and they were just exhausted and they needed to get this out of them in a certain way. Um, I call it the travel album because the titles always feel like they have a travel feel, like you've got Silverleaf and Snowy Tears, Sunshine State, Detroit Has a Skyline, Animated Airplanes Over Germany. Um, it, they all sort of have like a, a, a travel feel to it, you know? I don't know if that's me just putting that out the, on the, the record or if that's actually uh, some type of a theme, but you know, it always feels that way to me. It feels like this is a band that is just hasn't been home in five years, and this is what, you know, Mac was sort of feeling at that particular moment. 
You get that super fast opener with uh, Hyper Enough, which was sort of a, a single, a hit single, um, back at that point, you know. Almost had some, like, mainstream uh, success, you know. But, I mean, hey, the radio stations didn't have room. They had Green Day, and they played them over and over and over, and they didn't have any space for Super Chunk, apparently. Uh, that's called sarcasm. So, you know, were it not for the production, honestly, I think this could have been my number one. I really do love some of these songs. I mean, the best songs are uh, Iron On, the sort of that slow build of Sunshine State, you know. And when I saw Mac solo uh, a couple years ago, he played that song and it was like, oh my God, it was so excellent. Um, I really love Silver Leaf and Snowy Tears. Certain Stars, amazing closer on that one. Eastern Terminal is ex Eastern Terminal. I didn't mention that one. That's another one, part of that travel thing. But um, anyways, it's, it's a, an excellent, excellent album. And obviously, this was the end of the sort of original sound of Super Chunk because when they returned two years later, uh, they had worn weary of that sort of sound and were going into that next sort of slower experimental phase. Deciding between the number one and number two was just fucking impossible. And in fact, I started texting friends, you know, uh, people I've known that are like my age, you know, that remember Super Chunk from way back in the day. You know, they were there at the beginning or close to the beginning because I really need I wanted to see what there, if there was any kind of consensus on what's the best album. And and I, I nobody was giving me any consensus. So I chose number two to be on the mouth from 1993. It's the band's third album. It was produced by John Reese, uh, who you know from uh, Rocket from the Crypt and Hot Snakes, uh, known as Speedo at, at, at some point, you know, to some people. Okay, this was the first album to feature John Worcester in the band. Uh, he came in on drums after the original drummer left. He had done previous touring before that, but this was the first album that he actually appears on. And, you know, the original drummer was great. I mean, he, you know, not knocking him in any way, but. I do feel like it's a noticeable improvement. I mean, John Worcester is an excellent drummer, and um, he does pick him up a little bit, you know, from from the, the previous record, which, again, was great. We're going to talk about it in a sec. You know, this album is fast. It's edgy. It's aggressive. It's extremely catchy. Every song you're going to be singing along to when you listen to On the Mouth, it's so freaking good. And, you know, they, they again, they do pace it pretty well. There's... You know, really fast ones, and then there's just less fast ones. And it's, like, oh, I mean, I don't even know. It's so hard for me to articulate how much I love this album and how many times I've actually played it. If I had to pick, like, best songs, I would say, like, all of them. I mean, literally, every single song is exceptional. It's hard to pick, but I do. I do know how to make a, make a picking. So I would say Precision Auto, From the Curve, I guess I remembered it wrong. Uh, new Low, Untied. Did I say Mower already? I don't know. That was a single. Uh, came out on a separate single. I've got all the singles on the side here that, in case I needed to reference them or something. Okay, so coming in at number one is the band's second album. It came out in 1991. It's called No Pocky for Kitty. Now, when this album first came out, it was such a... Huge improvement in terms of production over the debut, which I had discussed was kind of grungy, kind of dingy, you know. Okay, but they went with Steve Albini in Chicago. Steve Albini known for working with bands like the Pixies. He hadn't done PJ Harvey or Nirvana yet, but he had done a lot of great underground records uh, in 1991 when the band went to, to work with him. They only did, uh, I'm sorry, they recorded the entire thing in two days just blazed through these songs. So this was the first album to feature Jim Wilbur on guitar. Okay, he replaced Jack McCook. Um, Chuck Garrison, the original drummer, still in the lineup at this point. He quit shortly after the album was, was released, and then John Worcester came in from that point on. But actually, you know, Chuck does a great job on this record. This album is relentless, blazing speed, super catchy. Um, you barely have time to catch your breath when you're listening to this album. It is so... Uh, just monumental. I mean, really, this album in 1991 for me, you know, it was like Nirvana, Nevermind, and No Pocky for Kitty, and maybe one or two other records that I'm not thinking of right off the top of my head that were the really important records that year. Um, 
I think their best song ever, perhaps, perhaps, is the song Throwing Things, and that's what closes this particular album. Monumental tune. Other greats on this one, Seed Toss, Cast Iron, Punch Me Harder, Tie a Rope to the Back of the Bus, uh, Sidewalk. You know, again, pretty much everything on this album is excellent. And <clears throat> this is, you know, when I really, I saw the band uh, play in support of this record a couple of times. Um, this was just a great period, you know, they were still a kind of a, a, a baby band and so you could just walk up to the merch table talk to them or whatever so it was great i got to meet you know laura back then i met john worcester um i spoke with mac i don't think i ever spoke with jim but anyways it was just a great period you know i was in college in 1991 i was 20 years old um this album brings back so many memories and i think that plays in big time to why this is my number one Super Chunk album. Okay, well, thanks for making it all the way to the end. Uh, much appreciated. I would love it if you could make a comment. Tell me where you, you know, would rank the albums if you had, uh, if you had your say. And again, uh, suggestions for other bands that you would like to see rankings for. Uh, feel free to put those in the comments as well. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye bye.